Good morning, Southeast. It is great to be together in the house of the Lord today. I want to thank all of you for being here. Uh, whether you're here in person, whether you're in person on Facebook, or whether you're watching later on YouTube. Our opening scripture today is found in the book of Hebrews, chapter 13. It's actually kind of a closing scripture. It's a benediction, but we're going to go ahead and open with it all the same. So Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are indeed grateful to be in your house this morning. We thank you for your presence in our midst, and we pray that you would accomplish your will amongst us. Be with those who are yet on their way. Be with those who are attending through Facebook or through YouTube. Lord, we ask that you would just permeate our gathering with your presence and that you would be honored and glorified and that you would accomplish your good and perfect will amongst us and through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And I invite you to take a songbook and turn to number 372. We're going to join in singing, I Am Resolved. And you are welcome to stand.
be seated and turn to someone and tell them what you're praising the Lord for today. So go ahead and just mention it to them. I'm praising the Lord for, and fill in the blank. Amen. And I'm praising the Lord. Vonda is back up in Michigan. She had a good week helping her sister move to Florida. So thank you for your prayers for her and Sherry. And now she's back up in Michigan. Hopefully she's watching today, and uh, uh, good morning. And she'll be home a week from Thursday, not that I'm counting. And uh, looking forward to having her back. And then also praising the Lord, John Mark and I were able to go up to Big Bear uh, Friday night, and we watched Chuck James, Rachel's husband, run in a Spartan race. It was about 12 and a half miles with all kinds of obstacles up and down the mountain, uh, the ski slopes, and he actually won. And so praising the, praising the Lord for that victory today. It was a victory just to complete it and then to come out on top. That was just super. So lots of praises today, but we also have prayer requests today. Um, Sam Seligman is requesting prayer for his wife, Faye, and we want to keep her in prayer. She's undergoing some uh, tests, has an infection, and just want to lift her up in prayer today. And I'm sure you know of others that are in need of prayer today. And so as we pray, just go ahead and mention them to the Lord. Uh, our psalm today is Psalm number 42. Psalm number 42. One of the things I like about Psalm 42 is that the psalmist talks to himself. I don't know how often you talk to yourself, um, but I end up talking to myself probably every day. And so what's, what I find especially insightful with the psalmist is that the psalmist encourages himself to put his trust in the Lord. And so we can have all kinds of people discouraging us, but hopefully we don't discourage ourselves. Hopefully we've learned to encourage ourselves, to encourage ourselves to place our trust in the Lord. So turn with me to Psalm number 42. And if you have a new international version as your translation, go ahead and pray this aloud with me. If you have a different translation, just follow along, and then I'll lead out in prayer, and we'll close with the Lord's Prayer together. So Psalm number 42. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while men say to me all day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to go with the multitude, leading the procession to the house of God, with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon from Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? 
Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Amen. Let's continue to pray. Lord, I just think about the psalmist and his openness and conversation with you as well as with himself. And Lord, we go through those times when we know that you love us, when we know that you're smiling upon us, showing us your favor, giving us things to praise you for and to sing about. And then, Lord, we go through other times where we begin to wonder, where is your love? And what's going on that we don't sense your smile upon us that day? And Lord, in those times, help us especially to learn from the psalmist, to remind ourselves to place our hope, our trust in you, that you are good and that you are loving and that you are faithful and that you save. I pray, Father, that you would be with whoever might be going through one of those rough spots today and just kind of wondering where you're at and asking God, have you forgotten me? We pray, Father, that there would be a fresh awareness from you that, you're, that they're not forgotten but that you love and that you provide and that you make a way. And we pray, Lord, that in those times that you would enable us to encourage ourselves to keep placing our hope, our trust in you. After all, you are our maker. Uh, we're not here by accident. We're not here by mistake. We're not here by just random chance. Uh, you created each and every one of us. And you created us with purpose, that we would know your love and that we would share your love and that we'd reflect your love out into the world. And so, Lord, help us to live into that purpose by your spirit and by the grace of Christ Jesus. And thank you, Father, for how you attend to us. Engaged, uh, you are constantly engaged with us, that enthroned above, you stoop low. And you're mindful of our every need or every concern. Uh, you know what we need before we even think to ask. And we just thank you for your faithfulness today. Thank you for the ways that you provided for us this past week. Places of rest, food, clothing, friendship family, people to talk to, people who will listen to us. Uh, we're just grateful, Father, for the many ways that you care for us. And especially in those moments when we're not sure how things are going to work out, when it'd be very easy to kind of just come undone. Lord, you are bigger and you stretch out your arms around us. You hold us on your lap and you see us through. And we're so grateful this morning. And we thank you especially for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. We confess our sins to you. We confess our sinfulness to you. We confess that we fall short of your glory. And we confess that apart from your constant grace, we turn against you. And Lord, have mercy afresh upon us today. Cleanse us and purify us by the blood of Christ. May we know the joy of peace with you. And just thank you for your reconciling work. And then we pray, Father, that not only would we know peace with you in terms of the past forgiven, but we'd also know peace with you in terms of being reconciled and empowered to live faithful and true to you. Grant us your spirit afresh today. Empower us to be obedient to you and to trust you and to live resigned to you. And we pray, Father, that you would also empower us with your spirit to grow in our love for one another, that we would love each other deeply, that we would practice forgiveness, that we would see the best in each other. We pray, Father, again, that your spirit would kind of shift us off of being so self-centered and stuck on ourselves, whether we're trapped in our ambitions or whether we're stuck in self-pity, that you would shift us out of that and that you would enable us to keep our eyes on Jesus and that in keeping our eyes on Jesus, we would know your love and that your love would flow through us to others. Thank you, Lord, for those that you have blessed us with who help us to follow Jesus more closely, who help us to resemble Jesus better, help us to walk in his ways. And we pray, Lord, that you would use us to help someone else come to know Jesus. Use us to help someone else come to follow Jesus and to follow Jesus better, more closely. And help us, Lord, we pray. And Lord, we bring all of our praises and our pains to you. We've shared some of them with each other this morning. Personally, I just thank you for your blessings upon my family this week. How you've been with Vonda and her travels and with Sherry and now with her mom. How you were with Chuck James and... Rachel and John Mark and I up at Big Bear and the blessing that that time together was. Lord, just thank you for the many ways that you show your goodness to us. And Lord, we also know that we have those in our midst who are hurting today and those who are dealing with illnesses. We ask that you would be with Faith Seligman, keep your hand upon her and upon all those giving her care. Be especially near to Sam as he cares for her. And we pray, Father, that they would just know your healing peace this morning. 
We ask, Lord, that you would be with others who are dealing with chronic illnesses, things that just won't go away. And we ask, Lord, that you would bring your healing. And Lord, we especially lift Brother Eddie to you today. We bring him to you. Thank you for him. Just continue to keep him encouraged, we pray, and bring your healing to him and grant all wisdom and discernment to him as well as to his family. Lord, we think about those who are dealing with addictions. We pray for liberation. We think about those who are incarcerated today. Father, we pray that you would redeem the time. We think about families, Lord, who are grieving today because someone's incarcerated or someone is dealing with an addiction. We pray, Father, that you would comfort that family and that you would provide hope and strength for the journey. Yeah. And Father, we ask that you would be near to all those who are at a crossroads trying to figure out which way to go and what the next step is. We pray that in the midst of the darkness, in the midst of the confusion, that you would give the light to take the next step and to be able to take it with confidence, walking in your will that you will make a way. Father, we think about our, our nation. We think about our city. We think about our neighborhoods. We think about the world. It just seems like there is just so much heartache and heartbreak, so much pain, so much that's wrong. We pray, Father, that where there's leadership at whatever level, again, that there would be humility to seek you first. And we pray that leaders would truly be concerned about whom they're responsible for, as opposed to just being concerned about their own power. Yes. And we pray, Father, that you would work through each of them to work together and to work for the common good. And we pray, Father, that you would give them the wisdom to discern exactly what the common good is. And Father, we pray for your church wherever it's gathered today, here, across the street, downtown, all parts of the globe. Lord, we meet in such different contexts, but we have one Lord, you, and we live by one spirit, yours. And we ask that you would pour out upon all of us here, as well as all the other places your people are gathered, that you'd pour out upon us your spirit afresh, and that you would empower us to live faithful and true to you, to, to, to be a demonstration to the world of the Lordship of Christ and the blessing that comes when serving the Lord. We ask, Lord, that you would do such a work within us that others are hungry and thirsty for you and that they recognize that you're the only one that gives hope and peace. Lord, accomplish your will in us and through us for your glory. Grant us your spirit, we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 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 Well, it is good to have all of you here today, and thank you for your faithfulness in giving. The offering plates are there. Feel free to drop your offering off at any point today. Thank you again for those of you who use our online giving and those who mail it in or drop it by the church. It's, it's all appreciated. God is good. Now, all the time, all the time, God is good. Okay, I got a question for you today. This is kind of a little bit of a tricky question. So... Who are the shady people in your lives? Now, let me explain the question a minute. Okay, so when I talk about who's the, who are the shady people in your life, I'm not really talking about the people that you can't trust. Okay, so don't start naming off all the shady characters that you know. Okay, and I'm also not really talking about, you know, those who throw shade at you. Okay, so the shady people, they're not those who are throwing shade at you and kind of insulting you or putting you down. When I say shady, what I'm talking about, who are the people in your life that provide shade for you? Like the past couple days have been pretty hot. And you know that when you kind of move from out in the heat into the shade, you can kind of just catch your breath for a moment and just relax and and you just notice, oh, it feels cool and refreshing. So who are the shady people in your life? Not the ones you don't trust, not the ones that kind of are always throwing shade at you, kind of putting you down, but who are the shady people in your life in terms of those who actually provide shade for you? So name a person or two to the people that are sitting with you.
Okay, now I have one more follow-up question to that. One more follow-up. Who is there in your life that needs your shade? That needs you to provide some shade for them? You can talk about it if you want, or you can just reflect on it for a moment. But who are the people in your lives who need some shade that you could provide? Join me in turning to Isaiah chapter 32. Isaiah chapter 32. Lots of good conversations going on. I hear them. I hate to interrupt them, but you know that I will. So Isaiah chapter 32. Let's go ahead and turn there. The word of the Lord today from Isaiah 32. See, a king will reign in righteousness and rulers will rule with justice. Each man will be like a shelter from the wind and a refuge from the storm, like streams of water in the desert and the shadow of a great rock in a thirsty land. Then the eyes of those who see will no longer be closed and the ears of those who hear will listen. The mind of the rash will know and understand and the stammering tongue will be fluent and clear. No longer will the fool be called noble nor the scoundrel be highly respected. For the fool speaks folly, his mind is busy with evil. He practices ungodliness and spreads error concerning the Lord. The hungry he leaves empty, and from the thirsty he withholds water. The scoundrel's methods are wicked. He makes up evil schemes to destroy the poor with lies, even when the plea of the needy is just. But the noble man makes noble plans, and by noble deeds he stands. You women who are so complacent, rise up and listen to me. You daughters who feel secure, Hear what I have to say. In little more than a year, you who feel secure will tremble. The grape harvest will fail and the harvest of fruit will not come. Tremble, you complacent women. Shudder, you daughters who feel secure. Strip off your clothes. Put sackcloth around your waist. Beat your breasts for the pleasant fields, for the fruitful vines, and for the land of my people, a land overgrown with thorns and briars. Yes, mourn for all houses of merriment, and for the city of revelry. The fortress will be abandoned, the noisy city deserted. Citadel and watchtower will become a wasteland forever, the delight of donkeys, a pasture for flocks, until the Spirit is poured upon us from on high, and the desert becomes a fertile field, and the fertile field seems like a forest. Justice will dwell in the desert, and righteousness live in the fertile field. The fruit of righteousness will be peace, The effect of righteousness will be quietness and confidence forever. My people will live in a peaceful dwelling place, in secure homes, in undisturbed places of rest. Though hail flattens the forest and the city is leveled completely, how blessed you will be, sowing your seed by every stream and letting your cattle and donkeys range free. Amen. Let's continue. Let me pray and then we'll get into it. So, Lord, we thank you for your word this morning and thank you for speaking to us. We pray that you would give us ears to hear you, that our hearts would be open and receptive. We pray that we'd be mindful to be obedient to you. Lord, have your way. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. Well, I think you probably saw a little bit where the question came from today in terms of that rock that provides shade. But before we get to that rock, let me tell you just a little bit more about Isaiah, kind of where we're at. I know that just about all of you have been following along, but it helps me to kind of refresh for a moment. Okay, exactly where are we? And on a timeline, we're probably about 705 to 701 years before Jesus is born. So 705 to 701 BC, right in that kind of window of time. And the dominant empire, as you well know, is Assyria. And Assyria has been growing, it's been expanding, it's already conquered the northern kingdom of Israel, so they're quote-unquote off the map. 
And you will remember that King Ahaz, way back around 730, 735 BC, the King Ahaz was over Jerusalem and he was worried about those two kings to the north. Well, those two kings to the north are off the map now. But remember how Ahaz reached out to Assyria to protect him? And so he paid tribute to Assyria and he thought it was a good deal, but Assyria basically was ripping him off and exploiting him. And so instead of trusting in the Lord, he trusted in Assyria and Assyria has come on through and taken a lot of a lot of people, a lot of land, a lot of villages. Ahaz died and his son Hezekiah becomes king. And Assyria has other things to deal with. And so people are telling King Hezekiah, hey, let's rebel against Assyria. Let's quit paying taxes. We, we, can, we can get out from under them. Now's the time. And let's reach out to Egypt and see if Egypt will help us because we know that Egypt has lots of resources and that Egypt doesn't want to have to deal with Assyria either. And for a while, King Hezekiah resisted. He said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to reach out to Egypt. But about 705, he finally gave in. He thought the time was right, and he reached out to Egypt for help. And sadly, he never prayed about it. He never talked to God about it. He basically kind of did what his father did. Though as his father reached out to Assyria for protection, now King Hezekiah is reaching out to Egypt for protection. And neither of them really trusted the Lord. And so we think we're in this window where King Hezekiah has reached out to Egypt. Isaiah has been telling them that that is a mistake. And so Isaiah has been watching, you know, witnessing these two kings, father and son, make terrible decisions because they did not trust the Lord. They did not reach out to God. They tried to figure out how to make things work on their own. And he is seeing the people pay for it and what a difficult situation it is. And so we're, we're about in this time. And let me tell you just a little bit more, one more date that you need to have in mind. You notice in the text that Isaiah said about a year from now or a little bit more than a year from now. We think the event that he's talking about took place about 701. And that's when the Assyrians were pretty tired of Hezekiah and his people not paying their taxes, not paying tribute. And so the king of Assyria, he brought his army and they surrounded Jerusalem. And it looked like Jerusalem was going to fall. Now, I'm not going to tell you what happens yet, but 701, Jerusalem is surrounded by the Assyrians. They have it under siege. They can't get food in. You know, because you grow your food outside in the fields, not right in the city. And they can't get trash out. And so you have starvation. You have disease. It did not look good. And so Isaiah is warning them that about a year or so from now, we're going to have major problems. And he's calling them to wake up now. So that's kind of where we're at on the map, okay, of, of history. Now, in terms of chapter 32, there are three main parts to it. So the first main part is verses 1 through 8. And in 1 through 8, come on in. Uh, in, in you guys can just come in this way if you want, or you can go around. And so in, in 1 through 8, Isaiah is seeing a day of a new king. So he's seen these horrible kings. Well, Hezekiah, he was kind of good and bad. And so I don't know if I should just call him horrible, but Ahaz, he really blew it. Hezekiah, there was good to him, but he also messed up. So he sees these two kings and their failures. And so he has a vision of a day when there's a new king. Okay, and a new king that's going to reign in righteousness. So that's part one. Okay, part two is verses 9 through 14. 9 through 14. And here Isaiah is telling them that it's time to grieve. And he especially calls upon the women that it is time to start grieving, time to start crying, that there is a funeral that's coming. 
And so you're feeling pretty complacent, like everything's okay. No, you things are not okay. And you should start crying now. So that's verses, that's verses uh, 9 through 14. And then 15 through 20, the third part. They are to cry until the Spirit is poured out upon us from on high. And there Isaiah has a vision of a whole new future. And there is promise and hope for a day of righteousness and peace and blessing. So you have the promise of a king. And then you have, it's time to cry. And then the promise of the outpouring of the Spirit in which there will be a day of righteousness and peace and blessing. So we want to spend a little bit of time working through each of those sections. And so let's go to 32, 1 through 8. And again, remember the kings that Isaiah has seen that he's lived under, he has felt their bad decisions. Okay, and I think we can probably relate to that just in terms of our own country and the different presidents that we've had. And... You know, I'm not on the side of any one president. I'm just kind of like Isaiah, looking at them all and saying, you know, we know what it's like to live under the bad decisions of all of them. And so Isaiah is kind of there. And he understands that those decisions at the top, they affect a lot of stuff. And so he's seeing a day in which there's a new king. So listen to the word again. See, A king will reign in righteousness. And I would put in parentheses there, not like Ahaz and Hezekiah. A king will reign in righteousness and rulers or princes, his cabinet, if you will, his family members that have more that have power. They will rule with justice. So you have a king and his princes, his cabinet members, his leadership ruling with righteousness and with justice. Wow. See, the king was to lead by, in terms of righteousness, the king was to lead the people in keeping Torah. The king wasn't over the law. The king was under the law, under Torah. And it was the king's responsibility to lead the people in practicing Torah. And it was also the king's responsibility to kind of apply Torah to the whole people. So that everybody is living under Torah. Everybody is maintaining their relationships as God directs. And the king was responsible to lead in that. And so they have they have the gift of the Torah, the law. And again, sometimes we have a negative view of law. Don't think negative. Think law in terms of, hey, this is how we're to be organized. This is how relationships are to work. And the king is to lead the way in practicing that. And also in implementing that across society. So the king was to reign in righteousness. And those around him, those princes, if you will, or cabinet or Congress, they were to do the same. They were to follow the king's lead and practice this justice, this righteousness. Now, The imagery that gets used probably more than anything else is that of a shepherd. That a true king would reign like a shepherd. And the point that's being made there is that the shepherd uses his power, uses his strength to care for the whole flock. And especially the least of these. And so you all know the story of the shepherd where he has a hundred sheep and one got lost and he leaves the 99 and goes after the one. Okay, that's how a king was supposed to work. A king was to be concerned for all the people and use his power and authority on behalf of the weak, on behalf of the least. Okay, and that would be a king reigning in righteousness. And when a king did that, he was actually following Torah. And so Isaiah has this vision that one day we're going to be done with the kings like Ahaz and even Hezekiah. And we're going to get a good shepherd of a king who's going to reign in righteousness. And it will be a kingdom of justice and of blessing and peace. Now look at the next verse. This I think is just super interesting. Verse 2. Each man. 
will be like a shelter from the wind. Now, some of your translations might say each one or just each. But if you're looking at the Hebrew, it literally says each man. And so most translators go in the direction that each man refers to the king and his princes, the king and his cabinet. Each one of those will be a shelter, will be a, a uh, refuge. But, you know, the more I read this, the more I think that each man is each man. That it's not just kings and princes, it's not just those with power, but each man. Under the leadership of this king, each man will be transformed so that the words that can be described of that man is that that man becomes a shelter. That that man becomes a refuge. So you think about storms and you think about things that we need shelter from. And see, what tends to happen is if you have a bad king, then everybody kind of follows that king. And if the king is out for himself and the king is simply out to amass more power, then what do the people under that king do? Going to follow him. And it's like every person for themselves. Every man for themselves. And so you exploit who you can exploit and you take advantage of who you can take advantage of. Because it's all about getting yours. That's what the king does. But if we have a king of righteousness, then everything changes. And the men under that king, instead of seeing what they can get and grab for themselves, the men under that king are transformed so that they become shelters, places of refuge, can you imagine men being so changed that men become protective? See, we're talking a radical transformation here. That in a day and age where it was about using your power to get, now my manhood isn't about what I can get. My manhood is about protecting, about sheltering. And then look at the next part of it. Not simply protecting and sheltering, but did you pick up on the kind of the poetry that each man will be like a stream of water in the desert and the shadow of a great rock in a thirsty land? Those are symbols of refreshment. And so that men would be so transformed by this king that it becomes the nature of men to be protective, to offer refuge and shelter. And it becomes the nature of men to actually refresh and to restore. Wow. What a difference a king makes. Well, it goes a little bit further. Look what else happens. Then the eyes of those who see will no longer be closed. And the ears of those who hear will listen. The mind of the rash will no one understand, and the stammering tongue will be fluent and clear. No longer will the fool be called noble, nor the scoundrel be highly respected. It's like an awakening will take place, where people will see and they'll actually get it. Where people will listen and they'll actually kind of understand and, and follow through and obey. Where minds will be open, where tongues will be loose, and, and again, where where you'll finally get how we're supposed to live. This king will make such a difference. Now go with me back to Isaiah chapter 6 real quick. So you remember Isaiah chapter 6 is, is where Isaiah saw the Lord and the burning coal was applied to his lips. And he heard, he heard the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Isaiah says, Here am I, send me. Look with me at verse 9. Here's what the Lord told him. The Lord said, go and tell this people, be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. May the heart of this people, uh, make the heart of this people calloused, make their ears dull, and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. And Isaiah says, how long? And the answer is, until the cities lie ruined without habitant. 
But notice, if you get down to the end, the holy city will be the stump in the land, that there's going to be a remnant that's saved out of this judgment. I think I hear in chapter 32 that Isaiah is starting to see on the other side of this. That there's going to be a new king, and under that new king, people are going to be transformed. And men in particular are going to become places of refuge and shelter from the storms of life. The men in particular are going to be refreshing. Streams in the desert. Shade in a blistering hot day. Total transformation. And that people are going to be awakened so that they finally start to get life under this new king. So that they'll be able to see with their eyes, hear with their ears. That they'll be able to understand and live responsibly and obediently to the king. And their evaluation of people will change. And so no longer will the fool be considered noble. Rather, the fool will be seen for what a fool is. Someone who is rebellious against God. And someone who hurts the least of these. See, when you have a corrupt king, it looks like the only way to get anywhere is to join in the corruption. And then people, quote unquote, respect you for the power and how high you've risen in such a corrupt regime. But under the new king, it's not going to be like that. So look with me again at verse 6, or verse 5. No longer will the fool be called noble because they found a way to rise in power under this corruption. No, now they're going to be dissed. No longer will the fool be called noble, nor the scoundrel be highly respected. For the fool speaks folly. His mind is busy with evil. He practices ungodliness and spreads error concerning the Lord. The fool doesn't just reject the Lord. The fool convinces others to reject the Lord. He practices ungodliness and spreads error concerning the Lord. The hungry he leaves empty, and from the thirsty he withholds water. It's not just about the fool and the Lord. But the fool is also hurting those around him. The scoundrel. His methods are wicked. He makes up evil schemes to destroy the poor with lies, even when the plea of the needy is just. And so I can just see, as I'm sure you can too, when you have a corrupt king, then you typically have a corrupt cabinet. And you have corrupt levels of bureaucracy. And it's kind of like you've got to pay them all respect because they got power, but they don't care about you with that power. They're using their power to simply try to get more power, and they don't care about the needy. They don't care about the poor. They don't care about those who are being done wrong. Under this new king, it's not going to be like that. Under this new king, there will be justice from the top all the way to the bottom so that the poor, the needy, those who are hurting and broken are cared for. Verse 8. The noble man makes noble plans, and by noble deeds he stands. There's kind of a play on this word noble. It sounds a little bit like fool in Hebrew, but now we're talking noble, not fool. And the noble person isn't judged just by the level of power that they have under the king. The noble person is judged because they use their power, their status, in a noble way, a way worthy of honor, lifting others up. So that's the new king. And with a new king, there comes a new kingdom. With a new king, there comes a new way of living. And again, the, the one thing I want to highlight, I'll probably come back to this, the transformation that takes place under the new king. So that in a world where men were out to get and kind of take care of themselves, a transformation to where each man becomes a place of shelter and refuge in times of storm. That each man becomes like a stream in the desert, like the shade of a rock in a hot day, that you can get refreshment when you go into the presence of that man. 
Again, think about your conversations earlier today. The people in your life that provide you shade. And who can you give shade to? Here, this shade giving ability, this shade providing ability, why does it come about? Because there's a new king. And the result of that king's reign is transformation to where people don't just throw shade, to where people aren't just shady, but people actually provide shade to those who are in a dry and thirsty place. Well, much as I'd like to stop there, Isaiah goes on. He turns to the women and he singles them out. You women who are so complacent, rise up and listen to me. You daughters who feel secure, hear what I have to say. In a little more than a year, you who feel secure will tremble. The grape harvest will fail and the harvest of fruit will not come. Tremble, you complacent women. Shudder, you daughters who feel secure. Strip off your clothes, put on sackcloth around your waist, beat your breasts for the pleasant fields, for the fruitful vines, for the land of my people, a land overgrown with thorns and briars. Yes, mourn for all houses of merriment and for this city of revelry. The fortress will be abandoned, the noisy city deserted, citadel and watchtower will become a wasteland forever, the delight of donkeys, a pasture for flocks. See, when he's telling the women to mourn, this king is off in the future. Okay, but right now, you're complacent, like everything is well, and it's not well. You feel like everything is secure, like tomorrow is going to be the same as today, and you can just bank on it, and today's okay. And Isaiah is saying, no, you're not secure. It is time to cry. It is time to grieve. It is time to fast. It is time to humble yourself. And to recognize how insecure and unstable life is. That a little more from a year from now, it's all going to be lost. And many think that Isaiah is referring to Assyria coming and surrounding Jerusalem. And when they would come and surround a city, you know, where the produce is grown outside the city, they would destroy it. They wanted to make it impossible for the people that they conquered to recover So they're not going to just destroy the city. They're going to destroy the food chain, the food supply. And so Isaiah is saying, you think that everything's okay right now because you've reached out to Egypt and it seems like there's a calm and things are kind of stable. And so you're complacent. And you have a false sense of security. And he's trying to wake them up. Now, Why, I wonder, is he singling out the women? Because I doubt that the women were the only ones who were complacent. I imagine at some level the women were reflecting the false confidence of the men. That the men are thinking, oh, we got this under control. We got Egypt lined up with us. We're not paying tribute to Assyria anymore. These are happy days. We're all going to be blessed. And so I imagine the women were likely pretty complacent and feeling secure because of the false sense of security that the men were communicating. Remember, none of them could really see men and women. Why would Isaiah single them out? Well, Two thoughts. Maybe he's singling them out because when it comes to crying, women lead the way. Typically. Okay, then when it comes to when it comes to a funeral, who are your main criers gonna be? You know, the women are gonna grieve and express the broken heart of the whole community. And so maybe he's singling out the women because this in particular is maybe in their days kind of their role to lead out at a funeral where there's 
grieving and loss. And so, ladies, start leading now. It's time to start a funeral. Nobody can see it coming, but trust me, it's time. Start grieving. So that's one possibility. And I can't help but wonder, though, if there's a second reason. That maybe he thought the women would actually listen. Maybe he's crying out to the women, you ladies who are kind of stuck in complacency, maybe you'll hear me. I've been talking to a lot of men and they're not listening. Maybe you'll hear me. That it's time to start crying. That this going down to Egypt, that was foolishness. There's no security in Egypt. The men wouldn't listen to me. The king wouldn't listen to me. But you women of Jerusalem, maybe you'll listen. You daughters, maybe you'll hear and you'll realize that, wow, things aren't as good as we were told they are. Things aren't as good as we were led to believe. And they begin to cry. Maybe that's why Isaiah is talking to them, because maybe they'll be the first to kind of recognize, wow, things really aren't right. And so he calls, calls for them to begin mourning. And he, he describes it, that the city that was once a place of revelry and joy will be desolate, be broken, empty, deserted. It's pretty easy to get lulled into a false sense of security. And you can see things happening to other people around you, but as long as it's a little bit distant, we tend to feel somewhat secure until all of a sudden it gets close to home and we realize, wow, we're not as secure as we thought we were. And just side note, in my lifetime, probably the two biggest events that kind of rocked a sense of security, probably 9-11 and COVID, that I think both those things struck and disrupted our sense of security. And so that all of a sudden with those things happening, we realized, wait a minute, we're not quite so secure as we thought we were. Whether it's secure against attack, whether it's secure against disease, whatever it might be, but I think those were major kind of disruptions, if you will, to our sense of security. Isaiah is telling them, hey, this security that you think you have that leads you to kind of be so complacent and self-confident about life and about tomorrow, it's false. You can't, you can't build on that. And it's all about to get blown up. Okay, that's part two. Part three, glad I don't have to stop there. Part three, verse 15. You got to underline this. If you got your phone, find a way to highlight it. Till the Spirit is poured out upon us from on high. Notice, the Spirit is poured out from on high. It's God pouring out His Spirit upon us. And notice that it's us. That it's not just prophets. It's not just kings. It's us. Us in terms of the women. Us in terms of the men. Us in terms of the old. Us in terms of the young. But there is going to be major disruption come. There's going to be major disaster come. Major shaking come. But mourn and grieve and cry out. And all this is going to happen until the Spirit is poured out upon us from on high. And when the Spirit is poured out, look at the transformation that takes place. The desert becomes a fertile field. The fertile field grows and seems like a forest. Justice will dwell in the desert. Righteousness live in the fertile field. The fruit of righteousness will be peace, and the effect of righteousness will be quietness and confidence forever. My people will live in peaceful dwelling places and secure homes in undisturbed places of rest. Wow. You talk about a transformation to where when the Spirit is poured out, there's going to be justice, there's going to be righteousness, there's going to be peace, there's going to be blessing. Everything is transformed to where it all becomes right and good. 
And you know what it sounds like to me? The garden. It sounds like the Garden of Eden. That when the Spirit is poured out, those desert places, man, they begin to grow and become a fertile field. And the fertile field becomes a force. And so we just have this picture of, of life everywhere. And that there's this peace and this justice and this righteousness. That it's all good. That everything is whole and related together when the spirit is poured out. Radical transformation. People are changed. Living in peaceful dwelling places. Verse 19. Though hail flattens the forest and the city is leveled completely, how blessed you will be. Sowing your seed by every stream and letting your cattle and donkeys range free. Let me just unpack that a little bit. It's not so much free range because it's healthier like we would think of today. The reason why they can let their cattle and their donkeys kind of roam free is because the harvest is going to be so plentiful that it doesn't matter where the donkeys or their cattle might trample. So normally you would have to kind of have a pen for your cattle, your donkeys. You would have your, your garden area kind of fenced off so that you don't have to worry about your cattle or your donkey trampling your crops. But they're going to be so blessed Life is going to be such a garden that you don't have to pin up your cattle and your donkeys. They can go wherever because God's blessing is just so abundant. And that's the vision he has. So he sees this day in which there's a new king. And under that new king, life is going to be transformed. People are going to be transformed. But we're not there yet. It's actually time to cry. But we're going to cry and judgment's going to come, just like Isaiah experienced that judgment in terms of the burning coal. Judgment's going to come. There's going to be loss. It's time to cry. But that's not the end. The Spirit will be poured out upon us. And the Spirit will make all things new. And the Spirit will bring about this transformation. So this is Isaiah's vision. And so I have to kind of stop and pause here and kind of ask the question, okay, what Isaiah saw off in the future, where is it now? Where are we at in relation to this vision? And what Isaiah saw is already present today, but not yet in its fullness. Let me say it again. What Isaiah saw in his day about this king, about a time to cry, about the outpouring of the Spirit, and this blessing and transformation and peace and justice and right in the garden. That that is already present today, but not yet in fullness. See, we believe, we know that Jesus is that king. That Jesus is that shepherd king who gave his life that we could be rescued, that we could be transformed. He came announcing God's kingdom and he followed through, was obedient, went to the cross, died for us so we could be reconciled to God. God raised him and Jesus reigns. He is that king. And through Jesus' death and resurrection, the spirit was poured out. And so we are a people empowered by, under the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit empowers us to do righteousness, to do justice, to love mercy and practice mercy. The Holy Spirit empowers us to walk humbly before God, before the King. Through the kingship of Jesus and the power of his spirit at work within us, transformation happens. But you know what I know that the full vision hasn't been accomplished yet. You know and I know that there's still a lot of oppression. There's still a lot of evil that we struggle 
to do right. And so the not yet part is that at the second coming of Christ, this transformation of each of us, as well as the whole world, that's when it will be made complete. That at the coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ, the return of Christ, that's when you will have everything made new. It'll be like the garden again, only I suspect even better. But here's the thing I want to emphasize, that even now, it's happening. Even now, it's happening. That as men and women come under the lordship of this new king, Jesus, and receive his spirit, transformation is taking place. And the future is becoming now. And the way I see it, men and women of shady character, men and women who are really good at throwing shade, through the power of the Spirit under the Lordship of Jesus, those shady, shade-throwing men and women, you and me, we're becoming shade givers, shade providers. Instead of wearing people out, we can actually refresh them. Instead of people hiding from us, they can actually take cover in us because of the transforming work of the Spirit in our lives under the kingship of Jesus. So that we begin to live rightly and do rightly and practice this righteousness and this justice of the King. And that we can give shade and we can give refreshment and we can give shelter and renewal to one another we can be a bit of an, I don't know, a garden, an oasis in the midst of a world that still has a lot of crying to do. And we cry for that world. But, and we, we experience that. And so we, we're crying not just for that world because it impacts us too. We're broken. But we know the healing and the transforming work of the Spirit in our lives. And so we live with that hope of God's future becoming a little more now in our lives and through our lives. So I don't know exactly how this is, is landing on you. There may be some of you who today are realizing that, you know, I've been finding security in the wrong things. The things that I thought would bring me security, they don't offer me security at all. And maybe it's time to come to know the security of Jesus. That Jesus is the one who holds the future, and Jesus is the one who holds us, and our security is not in some Egypt or some Assyria or some job or whatever. Our security is actually in Jesus. And maybe today is the first day that you're actually seeing that or ready to acknowledge that and receive that security. So maybe that's how this message is landing on you. That for the first time, it's like your eyes are opened and you're realizing, wow, I've been trusting in the wrong stuff that I need to turn to this new king. This is the king that offers peace and security. Maybe the way this is landing on you is that you recognize that you need more of his spirit to be transformed so that, you know, instead of having shady character where you're not trustworthy, or instead of being a shade thrower, where you spend the bulk of your time putting others down, that you actually are so transformed by the Spirit under this King that you're able to give shade, refresh people, 
be a shelter for people. Maybe the Lord's talking to you about coming a little bit more under this kingship and receiving more, if I can say it that way, of his spirit so that the transformation is made more complete. And maybe today this is landing on your ears, just reminding you that Christ is Lord and there is hope. That while there's so much to cry about today, there's a new day coming. And it's already breaking in. And we have the privilege of being a part of it. Because of the king and his graciousness and goodness. So as we uh, wrap the service up, and Charlene and uh, Alex, I'd like for you guys to come back and lead us in blessed assurance. And I want to say it was number 407 in your songbook. Don't remember that for certain. But I invite you to stand and to sing Blessed Assurance. And it's in your songbook. And I'll tell you the song number. 437. Okay. 437. And as we sing, you know, you're welcome to pray wherever you're at. But if you'd like to come to the altar and pray up here, you're more than welcome to. Maybe it's about security in Jesus. Maybe it's about God's transforming work in your life. Uh, Maybe you just want to give thanks for the hope that you have. But you're welcome to come and pray. Pray where you're at. But just be sensitive to how the Lord would lead you.
Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious and holy Father in heaven, we are so grateful that you sent your son Jesus to be our king. We're so grateful for the gift of your spirit. We pray that you would empower us by your spirit to live under the reign of Jesus. Help us to recognize that in Jesus, you, you are our security. You're our rock. You're our peace. Help us not to be deceived into looking elsewhere. And then we pray, Jesus, that by your spirit, we would find ourselves being constantly transformed to where instead of being shady, that instead of throwing shade, that you so change us that not only do we become trustworthy, not only do we build others up instead of tear them down, but that we become places of refuge, places where people can find shelter, paper, pe places where others can be refreshed. Thank you for those that you have brought into our lives who refresh and shelter us. By your spirit, help us to be that way to someone else. And then, Lord, help us to live in the hope that we have in you, that no matter how much there is to cry about today, we know that you reign and that you're bringing a day of complete peace and righteousness and justice. Lord, use us to be a sign that that day is coming. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you all. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 God bless. Be shade. Thank you.